I'm Dan Kane. Um, I'm at the coveted 2 o'clock time slot when the catatonic state from lunch really sets in. Uh, but I'll do my best to keep you guys uh, both entertained uh, and amused and maybe get a pearl of wisdom here or there. Um, thought I'd tell you a little bit about my story. So uh, I started off uh, Cornell AGEC, class of 98. So I'll take you back in time all the way to 1994 when I first arrived. Uh, dorm rooms were wired, and there wasn't really a lot to do with it. So we played uh, Duke Nukem and uh, other games on this new network, but there really wasn't an internet um, yet. So the university had adopted it to, to push um, some material to us, and I think they were calling bare access, but the web hadn't gone graphical yet. And in 1995, the first browser, Mosaic, came into the market, and then Netscape came around, and Internet Explorer, and so I was, I was sitting in class, um, Dr. Cindy Van Esse's Intro to Stats class, and I couldn't keep up, because she was running it, I remember 1995, PowerPoint wasn't even really a big thing then. These were on overhead transparency wheels, uh, and a big overhead projector, and she was running back and forth, uh, writing stat curves, and teaching us stats. And I, I literally couldn't, couldn't keep up with trying to soak in the content uh, and transcribe the material. And so I went up to her and I said, you know, Dr. Van Ness, can, can we get course handouts uh, for this? Because I'm having a really hard time learning while trying to copy all the material. And, and she said, well, we used to be able to do that, but the class is now hundreds and hundreds of kids. Um, and there would be 30, 40 pages per handout. And, and the, the, the math doesn't work. Like, we couldn't, we couldn't make these things effective. Uh, and, and what I needed was not just the course material, but I needed a forum to be able to have additional content, additional interaction um, for learning the material. And so I offered to build a, it wasn't even called a website, I forget what we called it, a course site. Um, but again, this is 1995. Uh, and so we built this, this test where we took content from her class and we put all the documents and assignments, and we started to create group forums, we created discussion boards, uh, she started to post the grades online, and over the course of a semester, this thing worked. Um, next semester comes along, and more of the professors are like, we saw what you did with Cindy's class, could you do it for us? And I'm you know, happy to be helpful. Um, but over the course of that one next semester, I couldn't keep up, because I was getting dozens of emails every day for update this document, change this assignment, the answer key to problem 2A is wrong, we need you to rescan things, and so I hire my housemates. Because I'm like, hey guys, you know, I have a way for us to, I can say it here in this, this form. We measured success based on um, the type of keg we would be able to have. <laughs> so we went from Beast to Rolling Rock, and that was a huge upgrade. And then we went to Sam Adams, and then we started to get, uh, get more excited. But we, we built this entire company, uh, which was called Course Info, um, really to just help give back. We saw a real problem. I'm sure there was a Dan Kane in almost every university uh, in the country. But what we did was execute on it just relentlessly. We focused on building not even what we thought was a business. We didn't even know we had a software business. But what we knew is we were solving a real problem, and we started to realize we had scalability issues just doing it by hand. And so what we ended up doing was writing software to automate our own problems, to create tools that we would use internally, because it got to the point after that second semester that we were managing over 100 different class websites. And it's really hard for a small group of people to do that. So you build the tool. Pretty soon, the tools got good enough to use that we turned them over to the professors themselves and the TAs themselves. And they started to post their own assignment, update their own announcement, use their own grade book. Uh, one semester later, other universities are looking at what Cornell was doing and said, you know, can we get that? And Cornell pointed to this group of students and said, well, it's this group of students in college town. You know, they are, they, they built this technology. Um, and they're the ones helping us automate all these classes. And so a little light bulb went off in my head. Again, I'm you know, now uh, entering my junior year, and, and I was in business, you know, undergraduate business program for a little while, so I started to put some things together. Um, but I, I'm what you would definitely call an a accidental entrepreneur. I, I, I believe great entrepreneurs are built, not born. You have to have that drive. You have to have that courage. You have to have that grit. But to really get good at building a company and going out and raising capital and doing marketing and understanding your customer and figuring out the journey and building software and making it usable and then retaining the customers, these are skills which can be taught. And I'm delighted to see that the universe now has created programs around entrepreneurship, around business that are practical and pragmatic, that arm you with the tools 
you're going to need to be successful because they existed in bits and pockets. And, and the beauty of what happened in my Cornell experience was they gave me access to those faculty who were teaching these things. And they weren't necessarily in areas that I had focused in. I was an ag -ec major. So now it would be called Dyson. So I, I knew who the faculty were, but I hadn't yet taken many of their classes. But they gave me access to the business law, to the technology school, to the engineering program, where I could tap into more talent to be able to build this company. So fast forward, a couple of universities later are licensing the technology. Uh, I'm trying to speed up and finish my degree. It's time to figure out how do we raise capital, something I've never done before. Uh, so we put together a business plan, and we go out, and we shop it, and we get absolutely, and this is, this is 1997 now. So uh, the dot-com revolution was just about to hit. The globe had just gone public. Uh, so all of a sudden, a chat room was worth like billions of dollars. And all of a sudden, this internet craze was, um, was here. And it was less crazy than the month before to think that a 20-year-old CEO of a tech company could actually go out and raise capital and build something. But we, we knew what we well, I guess we knew enough to know that we didn't know what we needed to know. And so instead of us going out and just being blind and dumb about it, we raised um, capital by joining forces with another company, uh, a group that spun out from KPMG, to form what is now called Blackboard. And Blackboard was this, this accidental group of students solving a real problem and expanding it from a department to an entire college, to a university, to multiple universities, and then raising capital. And in the end, uh, Blackboard raised almost 200 million of capital, took the company public in 2004, uh, and then sold the company uh, in a private equity transaction uh, in 2011. Uh, Along the way, I learned that I had gotten a $200 million MBA uh, from all this different venture capital that I had put into the company, and they had been teaching me all along sort of how to do this. But I also learned that I didn't know practically anything. I knew how to build great culture, how to attract a great team, but I really didn't understand the nuances of capital raise. And so we brought in a CEO at Blackboard to help us learn how to raise capital. This is, again, to, to Lisa's credit, that team of people around you, it's OK to be vulnerable, especially with your own team, to tell them there are things that I just don't know how to do. And so, yeah, we can raise a couple million capital, but if you have needs to raise substantial amounts of capital, the best way to do it is to go out and find people who've raised substantial amounts of capital and find out how they did it. So building that network and surrounding yourself with that mentor base that can actually help teach you the mechanics of doing it, but also open up those, those doors. Um, because if you just walk in yourself, yeah, there's a chance you can be successful. Uh, but you're so much more successful if you walk in there with people that also themselves know what they're doing. So three times, Blackboard changed CEOs. First CEO helped us raise capital, and then they put us back in, and we were back in leadership. The whole time, we're on the board and learning. Second time was uh, the IPO, which is an entirely different process uh, to go through. And it's a very unnatural process if you haven't gone through it, because you are, you are, it's like Groundhog's Day. Every day, you're on a plane, different city, a whole bunch of meetings, and you're pitching the company. Um, and then you have this tremendous event. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it, it's, it's your publicly traded company, and now quarterly expectations are there, and there's a, a wonderful grind to, to build it as a public company. Uh, and then we brought in a third CEO who brought us international. And when I left Blackboard, we were in 122 countries um, in 22 languages. And so it was this wonderful experience on taking uh, a company from a, a dorm room through fundraising, building a culture of thousands of employees, taking a company public, and then running it for many years as a successfully traded public company. But at this point, I'm still an uh, aspiring entrepreneur. And my entrepreneurial journey wasn't over. Um, I, I left Blackboard because I felt that I'd made an indelible mark on something as important as education. And I did it with an incredible group of students. By the way, my housemates were with us the entire journey of Blackboard. And now they are all CEOs and executives of their own companies and their own startups. And they're doing wonderfully well. Uh, but I wanted to start something new. And, and I didn't know what, just like I didn't know that Blackboard sitting in that classroom was going to become this big company. Uh, but I just knew I had to try something in a, in a market of consequence that was equally big and equally exciting. Uh, and so I used the opportunity when Blackboard sold to move to Florida um, to try to be a better husband, better father to, to my wife and kids. Uh, and I lasted about two weeks. And uh, my wife was going to uh, either kill me or divorce me. And my kids were like, you're driving us crazy. Please go out and do another company, because you need to do that for you. 
Uh, and they had one stipulation, which was, uh, I had just turned 30, and they said, you really should get a checkup. You've never been to a doctor. And I'm like, well, if that's your only requirement, I can do it. Went to the doctor. Uh, doctor, you know, what, what brings you in? Nothing. I'm just trying to make my wife and kids happy. So do what you need to do. Uh, and they said, well, there's really, you know, they drew blood, took a history, and like, there's nothing wrong with you, but you're really tan. And I'm like, I'm unemployed. I moved to Florida. Kind of shrug. I'm like, I don't know what you expect me to do. And they said, we expect you to wear sunscreen and get a skin check. So I did. Um, so meanwhile, this is my first real interaction with healthcare. And I was appalled. I really was. That, that it was the year 2009. And everywhere I went, it was paper. It was a paper chart to check in. And it was a skewed photocopy that I'm trying to make notes on. And I'm flipping through all the intake forms. And I'm super disappointed that there isn't more technology in there. But I sort of chalk it up to, you know, this is the practice I went to. And it won't be that way uh, anywhere else. And they refer me to the dermatologist in the group. And I go to his practice. And they made me fill out the same forms. L literally, I'm in the same building. I'm like, can I just run down and photocopy it? It's the same form. They're like, no, we need our own copy for our own paper chart. And I was frustrated. The person who ended up coming in, uh, he had no idea who I was, which was fine. But I really gave him the business. And I'm like, look, this doesn't make any sense. It's super inefficient. Like, how can you possibly you know, connect the dots or transfer information if it's all on paper? And he's like, well, I'm just here to give you a skin check. I left that encounter. I'm there in, in, a, in a paper gown, kind of reading him the riot act on what technology can do for him. Uh, I walk out of there with a co-founder of Modernizing Medicine, which was great. Because I, I don't know a thing about healthcare. But I finally figured out over my years of Blackboard that there's a lot I don't know. And unless I have a, a co-pilot with me on these journeys, I can't possibly move these industries. Uh, so Dr. Sherling, who was the dermatologist I went to, um, is my co-founder. And I'm like, look, you know everything you need to know about the practice of dermatology. I know nothing about dermatologists, uh, but I know a lot about building tech companies and how to build systems that make this a lot more convenient and streamline your practice. And then we can do amazing things with data. And so how do we collect data and use data to actually understand what works and what doesn't in dermatology and how to anticipate your needs? Um, and, and the damn thing worked. So we went out from, from a lunch meeting to designing a business. And this is, OK. Again, shorter time machine, go back to 2009. 2009, you're still in the bottom of the worst economic climate in the history of the United States. Right? So raising capital for a tech company in healthcare, I'm not going to say impossible. I'm going to say highly improbable, even with a billion dollar exit behind you. Uh, we got lots of meetings. No one was going to write us a check because, and they were right, super highly regulated industry, incredibly crowded space. You know, you're going to need millions and millions of dollars to build your first unit and get it certified. Uh, and even then, you're going to be displacing big incumbent systems uh, with a lot of friction. And they weren't wrong on any of that. But I found a few VCs that were like, well, you kind of did it with Blackboard. So maybe you know, we'll look at this. We'll do some diligence with you. Uh, and I turned around, and I went to, to my co-founder. And I said, great, we need some beta customers who will talk to these venture capitalists and explain to them why the prototype is so much better than what they had before. And so Michael gets the, the group of betas together uh, and says, hey, we're going to go out, raise some capital. Would any of you make yourselves available for diligence? And they were like, By, yeah, absolutely. We would love to do that. But can we invest? And again, one of those little light bulbs goes off. You're like, yeah, all right. Yeah. Doctors want to invest in your company. That's a good sign, your customers to believe in you. But what I didn't fully appreciate was that these doctors not only wanted to invest, but they would become the best evangelist force imaginable. Um, and so we accidentally raised over $3 million from our customers before we had our first dollar of revenue uh, by just simply allowing your customers, your beta customers, to make an investment in the company. And we did it in a very fair and ethical way. We did it as a convertible note uh, so that there wasn't a valuation set on the company. It was a discount to whatever the Series A would be. Um, so there's a lot of mechanics. Again, learning that you know, entrepreneurs are built, not born. There's mechanics you can put in place for the right different opportunities to be able to, to unlock that sort of potential. And so we use this vehicle to build uh, the foundational elements to bootstrap uh, modernizing medicine. Uh, since then, we've gone on and raised over $300 million of capital. So if you add all that up, it's $500 million plus of capital. I'm really good at raising money and spending it. I'm OK at returning it. Um, but it's important to be able to do so. And, and the industries that I tend to serve need that level of capital infusion. Healthcare is insanely complex. It's wonderfully regulated. 
Um, and so to do things in healthcare, you have this huge barrier to entry, which makes it hard to get in, but also keeps others from kind of coming in and, and sneaking up behind you because of just the sheer volume of things you need to develop before you're allowed to be used uh, in the healthcare setting. That's something as a country we need to work on, and we're going to get better at it. Uh, but for the most part, modernizing medicine started nine years ago, uh, and today has grown to well over $200 million of recurring revenue. Um, we sell it to a handful of specialists, derm, obviously, because my partner's a dermatologist. But we got into ophthalmology and orthopedics and a handful of specialties. And we, we carved out a niche. And one of Lisa's other, Lisa had a lot, of, a lot of great nuggets of wisdom in there. One of the things she talked about was having focus. Um, when you want to move an industry as big as healthcare, you can't move it all at once. You have to find what's your swim lane, what's your niche, and just you know, trimming the bonsai, to use the other analogies that have been out there uh, from Scott, like, that is key. There's a lot of ways you can make money in almost any industry, but just getting really good at one or two things and establishing yourself there, your dollar will go so much further by reinvesting every dollar you get back behind that one concept than it will by saying, look, if we limit TAM, then it's going to be harder to sell. We should just sell to anyone that wants to buy it, which might be an entrepreneur's intuition, but you're actually going to end up in a worse place. You've got to decide exactly what you want to do and then go after it with a laser. Get that thing white hot. Get everyone in that market to know your brand, your name, your company, how you're differentiated, and then you can go into an adjacent swim lane. So fast forward to today, we're only in five specialties. There's a lot more swim lanes we can get into, but a company like Modernizing Medicine, even with all that revenue and all that tonnage of capital behind us, can only figure out how to move the needle in these few ways, and we're much better at doing it that way. All right, I want to make sure I save a couple minutes for Q&A. Uh, there's a lot of things I can, I can answer. I've raised a lot of capital. I've built companies and scaled them to a couple thousand employees. We've done international. We've done an IPO. Um, it's a lot of fun, but I want to make sure I save time for you all. So if we can turn up the house lights. Oh, thank you. Hi, uh, quick question. Uh, I was wondering if you could go a little bit more about how you actually co-partnered with somebody else to actually raise money with them, either the mechanics or how you went about it. Sure. So um, uh, the question was just around ra raising capital and the mechanics. Uh, what I'd say is if, if you, you are a first-time entrepreneur and you are raising capital for the first time, or you're looking to do a different sort of step up, right? So it's a different process from raising angel, which the best way to raise angel is to actually prove the viability of what it is you're doing, and angel investors will quickly follow revenue. Like, that's easy. Raising money without sort of having revenue proven out is tricky in any situation, even at best. It's a different tier to go from angel to venture, venture to private equity, private equity to like the really big you know, IPO type markets. And so what I'd say is make sure you have someone with you as an advisor who's raised money at that level or at the next level because they're going to be able to prep you on the types of questions that are going to be asked and what they're looking for as far as an answer. But more importantly, before you've even gone into that meeting, they're going to be telling you, look, this is what we need to demonstrate as a company to even get their attention. And so the, the, the short answer is you need to find mentors that have been successful at raising capital at the level you're trying to raise it at and, and sort of role playing with them. Like what's going to happen in this meeting? How's it going to happen? We did it the hard way, right? We kissed 100 frogs to find a prince. Uh, it's exhausting to do it that way and it's really painful to learn it yourself. But back when Blackboard was raising capital, there really weren't that many you know, 20 year olds running around trying to raise a few million dollars. It just was so new. Um, but when we finally figured out how to talk with people that had technology companies that raised capital, all of a sudden we realized, oh, it's about the business plan and showing a path to profitability and things that we hadn't even thought about. We thought, if you've got a great product and great service and we can show demand is off the chart, why wouldn't anyone put millions into it? And what we needed to show was an actual viable business. And so once we were able to demonstrate that, the capital came. Um, hi, my name is Sam Brickman, and I'm a junior at Cornell, and I'm also the co-founder of an edtech startup. Um, we're in the phase where professors are using our service as a pilot, and professors seem to be really excited about it. There's a lot of demand from professors using it. Um, but I'm interested in learning at Blackboard how you went from that stage where there was all this demand, professors were piloting the service for free, to actually receiving a check from the school and partnering with the university learning technology department if that even existed. So the, the short answer to your question is you, you have to start charging for it uh, until you're willing, until you're able to demonstrate that people are willing to part with dollars. Uh, you've got a great concept, a great, a great idea, a great software. You know, students love it, faculty love it. But until you can actually demonstrate viability of revenue generation, 
it's not a real company yet. It's 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 a it's a thing. It's interesting. It's fascinating. It, it occupies time. The the revenue generation is what people are going to look at and say, all right, if you can do that at small scale, how do we invest and scale it up? Um, there are some angel groups that will invest on kind of a hope and a prayer of a viable business model um, because there may, it may be translated to other you know, adjacencies in which they've seen it work in the past. But if, if you really want to know like the path to success for your business is, is go from demonstrating that there's a lot of demand for it when it's free to there's you know, demand. It may not be as high when it's free, but there's real demand for it when people are paying for it. And then, believe me, they'll be knocking down your door trying to figure out how they put more money in. But Dan, how, how did you get Cornell to pay for it? So, good because, question. Because Cor I, right, it's a real I know, question. I know Cornell does not like to pay for much. No. Right, so. No, it's Cornell doesn't like to, and nor should they. They gave me this education. They're like, we've given you all the tools. We gave you access to faculty, and without their help, there wouldn't have been a blackboard. They're like, we shouldn't have to pay for it. And I gave them the same answer I just gave you, which is, it's not a real company unless people are willing to pay for it. Right? So at first it was like department funds. Actually, at first it was them paying me as an hourly like employee. <laughs> right? It was like six bucks an hour and I was going to build these websites. And we couldn't scale that. And I said, well, I have a better idea. I'll hire my housemates. Uh, and you just pay us as an LLC. So I walked down you know, to, to the commons and incorporated the business. And we, we scaled it that way. But it, it went from a, a concept that everybody loved to something people were willing to pay us a little for. But again, proof that there was value to departments actually paying us you know, a couple thousand dollars a semester, to colleges paying us tens of thousands of dollars a semester, to the entire universities paying us substantial sums of money for access to the software for unlimited use on their campus. Okay, who else? More questions in front? Oh, a lot of them. Just because you're closest. Oh, Here you go. <laughs> um, so typically, when you are selling to universities and other educational institutions, um, what are the point people, like who are the point people, which departments do you target? So um, it depends what you're selling, uh, but more important than what you're selling, it depends who's able to approve the buying of it, right? Universities are an insanely hard market because the sales cycles are very long, the, the bigger and more enterprise it gets. So good news is once you're entrenched in a university, you're entrenched. It's very hard to make a switch. Uh, but that being said, it, you're looking at two to three year sales cycles in higher education, right? So you need a group of champions to sponsor it, you need a department to get involved, and then you sort of need to get approved as a vendor, and then you need to be budgeted for the following year, and then you're finally in kind of two to three years later. Um, you're better off finding something where you can sell it at a smaller scale to prove the viability. Again, individual faculty, what, what, what that gentleman's doing, or uh, a department or a group of people, and then showing that it works, and then trying to get the bigger enterprise accounts. But make sure you make that switch because it is not as scalable, even if you're like, well, if I can just sell faculty by faculty, I can go grassroots, um, it, it's, it's not as reliable, and also universities have a lot of power to shut you off at a certain point. So you wanna start transactional, as I call it, and then move into enterprise as quickly as you can. Okay, one more. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lara. I'm currently a junior in the Dyson School of Business, and I am wondering how you went about dividing ownership and partnership when you were founding these companies, especially as you brought in investors. How did you divide up the shares? Great question. Um, you have to be a good person and be equitable, right? So when we divided up what became Blackboard, it was equal shares to all of the people we brought on board, you know, after we got the company started. And these are, these are housemates, like that, their claim to fame was, you know, I'm a, I'm a double E major, I'm a Matt Sai major, but they were my housemates, they were my best friends. I know classically they say never start a company with your best friends. Who else is gonna work for free for months before there's like a promise of something someday? Um, so you be as equitable as you can be. Um, and make sure that they all have real skin in the game to do that. And so nothing changed when investors came in, we were all diluted equally. Um, and that just continued as we went through all the processes of, of raising capital for Blackboard and for ModMed. For ModMed, a little bit different because it was just myself and a co-founder, but as we started to bring on employees, we have routinely given more than 10% of the equity out in form of options. So we do a 10% option pool when we start the company, we hire executives and we hire employees and we, we, do, we paper it out because everyone really should be a part of it. If you're there at the early start of a company that goes on to become a unicorn, they should walk away with that with at least a million dollars. I mean, that's how you really should be thinking about it. Like, is it fair that someone who was there from the beginning isn't really doing well? And your answer will probably be no, they should all do well. Like, you should do well yourself as a founder, 
But at the end of the day, everyone who's a part of it should also have some skin in the game. And so um, creating a very generous option pool and replenishing it. And, and one of the early talks, we're talking about how the board aligns with the, the entrepreneur founders a lot. That's true. Like, I've never gone to a board meeting where I said, look, I need to replenish the option pool again. We're all going to get diluted by 10%, but this is why I need to do it. I've never had that conversation end in anything except we understand why it's important. Go ahead and do it. So, well, Excellent. thank you all so much. Hopefully there was a pearl or two of wisdom in there. <laughs>